Uh, this is Lorenzo. He's with uh, Curatech. He's actually one of our, our Docker captains. Uh, he's a partner that's helped uh, Diego at Intessa, uh, you know, design and build this system. Uh, interesting facts about Diego. He's got a master's degree in embedded systems and a passion for IoT. Uh, and so he's, I don't know if he's combined those things, but he's hopefully not, <laughs> embedded a system in his goldfish at home uh, to track it continuously and, and always monitor his, uh, <laughs> his, his goldfish as a thing, I guess. But <laughs> they have a great presentation today on how they have uh, you know, built up this, this resilient um, you know, set of data centers and, uh, and how they've used Docker to, uh, to do that. So guys, welcome and, uh, and take it away. Uh, at the end, we will have time for questions. You'll see microphones spaced out here. Uh, we ask that you go to the microphones if you have questions so that we can record the question along with their answer as well. But we'll repeat that when we get to it. All right, thanks guys. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Jim. Great, <laughs> already aligned. <laughs> Synchronized. So welcome everyone, my name is uh, Diego Braga and uh, I'm working in Tesa San Paolo that uh, has uh, taken inspiration from a local beer, is probably the first bank in Italy. And uh, nice. I'm gonna talk uh, to you about uh, what we did uh, in our data centers that I think it's, uh, it's really interesting. A couple of numbers. We are... Uh, a really big company. I mean, we are leader in Italy with uh, um, 4,000 branches uh, in the country. We cover 107 provinces. It's just one that is not covered. That I don't know why. But uh, we are also present. Uh, we have a strategic presence abroad. So there are other 7.7 .7 million of customers outside Italy. And just a few numbers. The total number of customers are uh, about uh, 18 million, and we have uh, 5,000 branches divided. Most of the parties in Italy, but there is a consistent number abroad. And uh, our market capitalization is around 44 billion euros. That puts us in the fifth place uh, in, the, in Europe. So, in Tesla San Paolo, I don't know if you ever heard about uh, us, but uh, we have a strong presence and we are uh, a big reality. As a big reality, we have uh, some needs. And uh, we have basically three needs. The first one is uh, that we want to be cloud ready. Cloud ready for us means uh, that uh, you can manage complex applications on complex hybrid infrastructures. And our first step was to move to infrastructure as a service and platform as a service in the last years. That was uh, one step to go to the cloud, but it's not enough in our vision because uh, you can move uh, virtual machines, but uh, the data has to come with you and also the network configuration. And uh, we decided that infrastructure as code is uh, the next step that can bring us closer to be cloud ready. The second uh, need that we have, uh, we are a legacy company and basically all the applications are monoliths and we want to break down them. We want to break down because, uh, as you can imagine, even the fewest uh, uh, change of uh, code means that you have to redeploy all the application in all the environments into production. So this is a complexity that we want to get rid of. And the third one, from the infrastructure point of view, we don't want any more uh, human errors when we need to deploy infrastructure. We want a uh, self-described uh, immutable infrastructure in every environment we, we deploy it. And so we, we are focusing on infrastructure as code, where we can describe the application, how it's composed, and how it must be deployed in every environment. So this is our, our three needs, the three basic needs that we have. And how we did our approach to containers, we we cannot uh, rewrite from the ground up the applications to be with uh, microservices and so on. So we took uh, ex an existing application and we put it on containers. And even if you think that this is really simple uh, without uh, any pain, it was a pain for the processes and methodologies because uh, developers ask us, uh, uh, we cannot go uh, in, with SSH inside the container. 
or how can I open a ticket uh, if my container is dead? And uh, so it was uh, more difficult to explain what is a container than uh, can doing... Can use SSH? <laughs> but it was, uh, we had to explain uh, to our company that the, the reason to, to this uh, <clears throat> journey. And so we had uh, containers, but we need to uh, find new methodologies and new tools to uh, enable continuous integration and continuous deployment. And it was not so easy because, as you can imagine, we, there are uh, <clears throat> eight, uh, 80,000 employees in Intesa San Paolo in Italy. So um, discussions can be difficult. So, <laughs> but uh, at the end, uh, we had uh, our new methodologies, our new tools, and now we are able to go into production with Docker. But, but. first, the technology is really nice. It's, uh, we, we don't have that, any doubts about it. But is it supported? Because if the, uh, we, the, the stack is not supported into production, our management says, OK, guys, we are not doing anything about this. So we took our perimeter, application, application perimeter, and we divided it into four stacks, technological stacks that are uh, divided between uh, a complete Microsoft-based task, a uh, Java-based task uh, with the application server from Oracle, and uh, other two stacks uh, that uh, the difference is the, the type of database, uh, and the application server is uh, JBoss. Uh, we saw that uh, the compatibility with Docker is uh, uh, available and is supported. The fact that if you want to use the JBoss supported image, you cannot use Docker because you don't have support from the data. But, uh, so it's partially supported. You can use the Wildfly open source community version. But uh, at the end of this exercise, uh, we were uh, confident that we can put into production these texts on Docker. But, okay, technology is nice, it's supported. Okay, we, get, we are going business, the business uh, came back to me and said, uh, okay, but how much, how, much money do I need to spend? Are there any return on investments? Am I saving money? And we said, uh, okay, we, we need to study then the business case. And at the end of the, the business case, we, see, we saw that uh, the difference between uh, an ES6i license and uh, a Docker Enterprise Edition license is not um, so much. It's basically the same price. I don't know your... Uh, commercial uh, deals, but at the end, uh, there is no such a difference. So the real business case is consolidation. You, you need to consolidate more. With Docker, you, con you can consolidate more than virtual machines because the sharing of the resources is different. And so the, um, the business case we showed to our management said uh, uh, we can save money because we are consolidating more. The worst business case is having Docker Enterprise Edition on virtual machines because you are paying an hypervisor and then you are paying Docker for doing the engine. So this is uh, really the, the worst case uh, that you can choose for business case. So business case is right, support is right, the methodology is right, let's do it. Okay. What, what is our actual infrastructure? We have two main data centers, two production data centers. One is in Turin and one is in Parma. The, the distance is two kilo, 200 kilometers. And in Turin, we have a production site with two uh, data centers, so there is high availability. And the same is in Parma. The fact uh, that you see the business continuity between the two data centers, because uh, as we are a critical uh, company for the country, if we have a fault uh, on the data center, we can put in crisis the entire country because no one can make payments, no one can uh, pay salaries, so it's, uh, it's quite uh, a big problem. So business continuity means that uh, for regulato regulatory law, we need to maintain a disaster recovery site on both uh, the data centers. So there is a, a portion of the infrastructure that we maintain, that we pay, that it's basically a waste of money, just because we, uh, we need to have a disaster recovery site and we really hope to never switch it on, ever, because otherwise there is a natural disaster on one of the two sites. So our CIO said, 
okay, guys, we have uh, such power that is on, in idle or switched off. Can we switch it on and make a huge, big production site uh, with a geographical high availability? And we said, uh, yes, we can do it. How we did it? Lorenzo? Hello. So what happened? One day, I was starting my containers. I was happy. And he said, we had to do this thing. So I said, well, the first problem is you don't want to use hypervisor, right? So we have to buy the hardware. <laughs> but I am 24 years old. <laughs> I never bought hardware. So <laughs> it was difficult. So we started involving all the people in the company. And they helped us uh, by their experience to choose the right hardware for our solution. And we ended up with this situation. So from the left, from the right on your side, we have the switches. We have five switches for each data center. This configuration is for each site. We have the two sites. So this is to be double for the whole data center. We have the five switches, which are actually true leaves and two spines. We will see later what this means. We have five infer nodes, which are the UCP, the DTR, the ingress networking, and all these kind of infrastructure things. And we have the seven workers, which are basically kettles. Uh, we uh, have to be enabled to wipe them anytime. So what happens is that we just have five nodes that are completely stateful while the other seven nodes are not. And we, of the seven nodes, there are three nodes on each, uh, on each side that are dedicated to storage, software-defined storage with Elastic File. And the other nodes, you can add more and more nodes, are for containers. So this is the, basically the situation on, the, on one of the two data centers. Those three are three racks. On the racks, there are mounted the machine we've seen before. On top of each rack, there's uh, a switch, which is the spine of that rack. So it joins the BGP domain with the leaf outside. And the leaves are here to allow the switches to join the core networking of the company. So every single container in the racks is connected to the company. This was one of the major difficulties we had, because integrating containers inside an existing core network topology of a bank, which is with a lot of layers, like containers, but as layers, it was very difficult. Indeed. And all this goes through a WAN. Um, one of the major things that who saw this talk before asked it to us was, OK, so you are connecting to data center, which are 200 kilometers far. And we said, OK, we are not connecting them through the internet. We are connecting them through a dedicated um, dark fiber channel. So it has 4 milliseconds of latency. I measured that there's more latency between my laptop and my TV at home than between two servers in the two data centers. And this enabled us to do a lot of fantastic things like asynchronously replicate the data between the two data centers. This setup we are showing you is not something that you do putting two computers in two different data centers without spending money in connecting them well, right? So uh, don't take this talk as this can be done. We, we can do a, a swarm cluster stretched on two data centers without a good networking connection, right? So this is an important disclaimer for who is listening. This Don't talk. try this at home. <laughs> no, try this at home. But try this at home try this, if you have a At least with our setup, or better even. So the situation that we had to connect the two data centers was basically that the two ABGP domain that we have are directly connected through the company one wider area network. So this is a geographical distributed cluster. And in this cluster, we have another switch which is collecting uh, the cables <laughs> that goes to the desk of the operators, right? <laughs> so that's basically a, a place where they can uh, use the UCP, use the DTR, push the images, where you put the plug of Jenkins to do the build that go to the DTR and things like that. 
This is how the networking works. We have the core networking traffic, which is the main bank networking traffic, so everything goes through there. So if you need to talk with another service which is not containerized, you can go through the core networking traffic. But all the networking traffic going through containers is going in the internal networking traffic tire. In there, we didn't have uh, any specific configuration on the switches. We just took the switches, plugged it on the racks, plug it to the BGP domain, and everything is okay. There's no specific configuration to the switches because everything is, an, is handled at an higher level by Docker. So yeah. there's... We were discussing with the TLC department uh, yeah. if uh, they ask us if uh, we want to see the VLAN tag. And we yeah. said, no, it's completely yeah, yeah, useless yeah. Uh, for this. So basically, there are no defined VLANs. There it's are no just trunking. fixed LANs. This means that... It's not that it's just everything defined by Docker, but we have the encryption because we are moving legacy application through that. And those legacy applications are um, normally have a firewall, have all their things that keep them protected, but in this kind of situation, there's no the firewall, there's nothing. So with the overlay networking, with multi-tenancy, by isolating networks and by encrypting them, we the encrypted through the issue this morning. Uh, we became also network engineers, and so we could do, we could do that. But the salary is the same. Uh, the salary is the same, right? Yeah, always there. So you might ask, that's the spine leaf, you know, thing. So that, that setup it's quite old. It's very, you know, common. It's very not just common. Banks have that, so it's probably something that needs to be replaced, right? No, it revealed itself very, very useful for our situation because it's very consistent. It's very well known, so every network engineer knows that very well. We find a lot of people in the company that could help us, basically. It's consistent. If we add more uh, servers on the racks, or even if we add more racks, we can just join the domain and there's no added complexity. Or increasing latency. Or increasing latency. And as I said before, with this kind of setup, we don't have to configure anything, nor the switches, nor everything. We just give an IP address to, to the machine, and everything is done. Four, seven, eight, nine port, the UDP port for the VXLANs, and everything OK. And what about the software? Because, yeah, there was the, hard net, the hard, hardware part, because we had to do that, but we are mainly software-defined people, so we found funnier to do this part. The situation is that we have basically the infrastructure, we have the AVI Networks controllers. AVI Networks is um, a load balancer, an ingress network, uh, routing mesh, and software the proxy, defined. software defined. We will explain later all the features, but that's basically what you need to know. There's the UCP, so that's the management straight of Docker, because one of the main goals we had was that we wanted uh, to obtain the pure definition of a cluster. A cluster, by definition, is a set of computers that is seen as a single computer by who uses it. So by having software-defined storage, software-defined network, we already had that. But we needed also uh, an entry point for us to be able to say, I want a network, I want the storage, I want application in there, I want to run this. So the entry point is the UCP. And there's, there's the Elastic file, which has the tree storage you node know, in blue. There's the DTR, the Docker Trusted Registry, which has its dedicated node in HA. And there are the worker nodes. So what's expected to change when we need more computing power? That we are more, we add more light green nodes. Just that. This is the same view but stacked. So as you can see that there's the two sides. You can't even, you know, uh, see when you are on the higher level where your container resides. I mean, if um, something happens in Turing, everything continues working. 
It, there's no added problem at this level because it's completely abstracted. There's the physical networking, which is what you showed before. There's the software-defined storage, so three node and three node asynchronous is replicated by Elastify. And on top of that, we have container runtimes. Container runtimes, I mean Docker Enterprise Edition container runtimes. Those container runtimes are providing the foundation for computing in this situation. So foundation for software-defined storage, Elastify, foundation for network, Docker with the Swarm and with the Lim network, foundations um, for the networking at an hardware level with the core switches and the BGP domain, and foundation for engines with the, for uh, co computing power with the Docker runtime. In our cluster is a mixed cluster. We waited that for a long time, <laughs> and we have been able to do that with the latest release. So now we have application running on Linux. I hope that our most application running on Linux, and application running only on Windows. So uh, for example, we just migrated an application that has all the web servers. It's written for IIS, but it has the database on Linux. So it's IIS and MongoDB, so everything just fitted in this setup. I mean, the team could write the Docker Compose file and just that. It deploys the Windows container on Windows and the Linux containers on Linux, so it worked. Then there's the software-defined network. By default, we enforce that it has encryption and that uh, it's distributed. And on top of that, there are the containers. So uh, the thing that people see, it's containers. So they can interact by creating containers and just that. And on top of everything, for application that needs to expose HTTP or HTTPS, there's AV network ingress. So you might say there are a lot of components, there are a lot of hype on everything. Why did you choose? Elastify, why did you choose Docker? Why did you choose heavy networks? It's a very, it's a very tough qu uh, question to answer. We have been around for like one year, trying experiments, everything. We, before this project, we, we did together a ton of things. <laughs> so we have been very you know, critical with solution. We have been very, um, how to say, we have been very practical in doing things. So we found that we had to take the, the thing that just works. That's the most important thing in a bank. It's not that um, we couldn't do even uh, complicated things or difficultier things, but things that just works provide a good foundation to do more. They don't need to do cluster management they need to have an infrastructure to run their application. That's the focus. So with the last file, we got a very good platform that's enterprise ready, that's the only that provided us that kind of performance on the infrastructure we had. It can be deployed anywhere. The components we choose are not just for Docker. The main goal of this thing that we do, the, the project that we did, it's that we have Docker, but the storage we are using isn't just to be with Docker. It must be mounted on all the other components there are, that there are in the infrastructure. It's very, very modern. It has been written from scratch. We have a lot of chats with the guys from Elastify so that they explain everything that's going inside, and it's also very cool. And it basically, and it basically just works. We put it on the application, we put it on all the workloads, and everything working. Then there's the AVI network, because Docker Data Center has the HRM ingress. So you might say, why did you have another component when you have the HRM ingress, which is basically a component of the, that's a great component, actually. If you need something to, load balance your HTTP or HTTPS traffic, it's good, but it's in Docker. We need something that's outside Docker. We need to balance, 
for example, if you need to do a mesh between a service that is on virtual machines or on mainframes and mainframe. Docker, <laughs> a bank should say mainframe at every conference, right? So mainframes. And a service in Docker, how we do that with the HRM? It's not possible, right? So that was one of the decisions. As Elastifile does, it will allow us to do the peaks to the cloud, so we can, Diego will explain more, we can put a part of application on the cloud. And most importantly, it provides a very fine-graded, uh, um, a very fine-graded information and monitoring on what's happening inside the network from the load balancer through the container. So it's like application performance monitoring for just that part. So it was very interesting to see that someone just go to the web page and you see the traffic flow and it was so awesome. So and it's very integrated with Docker. So it was funny. The components to build infrastructure at some point were just not enough. <laughs> we need to, as Diego said before, to integrate this thing not just with the, the current infrastructure but with the current people because that's a bank and they have like a ton of people that are used to work in a way, right? So one of the most important challenges was to help them work in another way or at least to help them thinking in another way. That's the most important thing, because they could continue doing what they, do, what they did, but the most important thing that they have to understand is that there's more. So we started other side projects with the change management team. The change management team is a whole team that managed the code from, by taking the code from who wrote it, to putting that to the production. It's not that in this bank, they, the developers take the code and put it in production. So this is a cultural gap. So in this kind of situation, you want to own your code and put it in production, right? So we found a way to do that by integrating their existing team and saying, OK, the team just handles the infrastructure, doesn't handle how the code is deployed. They provide guidance, they provide the guidelines, but they handle just that. So what happened? There's a build cluster with Jenkins where the code is checked in from version control and it, and it creates mainly two things. It creates artifacts because it's not just containers and put the artifacts on the artifacts repository. After that, there's a, a whole instrument they created that take the artifacts from the repository and create containers. Those containers pass through all the stages from different registries and depending on their current level of testing, they, are, uh, they pass through functional tests, UAT and performance testing and then they go to staging and there's the feedback that go back and the flow continues until the feature is completed and works and then everything goes to production. This is handled by three main instruments, GitHub, Jenkins and the Docker Data Center. So in the end, what we noted was that the two data center were, were more unified. They were embracing others. Also, a main thing about the two data center is that they are run by different people. They are very far, but in this kind of situation, there was even the people were starting, you know, hugging each other, and everything was so funny. So the project yeah. went very well. We did just a it's couple of things. Yeah. Just you. Thank, Thank you, Lorenzo. You. So uh, everything is really nice. It's, it was uh, funny but uh, difficult as well because uh, it's more the cultural gap to 
to close then the, the, the technology to put into the production. But we did it, uh, we told you how we did it, and uh, our next steps then. You know that uh, you design the size of your on-premise infrastructure based on the peak traffic of an application because uh, you cannot predict the peaks, so you, you do a study and you size uh, your infrastructure on-premise for the peak of the traffic. So most of the time you are wasting your, your infrastructure. With this nice. use case, with this use case, we, we can design now the infrastructure for the average traffic, and uh, if there are any peaks, maybe in the banking uh, field uh, at the end of the month, basically, uh, we can scale out. Okay, we can scale out, uh, and we want to scale out uh, on public cloud, because uh, each of the components we showed you can scale on cloud, on any public cloud. So uh, this is will be our next step. Of course, for doing this, uh, you, you don't have to go through your proxy, but again, uh, you need to find uh, a proper connection to the public uh, provider. But uh, at the end, uh, what we did is uh, perfectly suitable for this uh, scale out. And uh, so we, our containers can uh, move to the, this hybrid infrastructure. And the next step, second step, will be cloud brokering, because uh, uh, how do we choose the pu public provider? What is the KPI? Maybe it's uh, the cost of the, the public infrastructure. So we will evaluate the tools that can help us to switch between public clouds. And uh, mm, of course, you need to have the, the billing of the public uh, providers, because uh, at the end of the day, your peak on the public cloud, it doesn't have to be more expensive than sizing before your infrastructure bigger than the average traffic. So this is uh, what we're gonna do the at the, in the future, the close uh, next days. This year? Hopefully. Next year? Next year, next oh, year for sure. In 18. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. So we have, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Again, if you do have questions, there's microphones here. Uh, you can line up the microphones. Um, if you don't have questions, you know, you're more than welcome to seek these guys out afterwards as well. No questions. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Oh. I just had one. Since you guys are working for a bank, and banks are very touchy about their data, even more than most businesses, how do you plan to deal with scaling to publicly available cloud systems where Oh, your data is not yours anymore. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We, we ask ourselves the question even before the use case. Because our CIO asks to the infrastructure guys, okay, data, you, you, we cannot put uh, privacy and uh, our personal data on public, but are we using this uh, law for not doing anything to do this? because uh, it's just an excuse, or are we able to do it when uh, one day someone will say you can put uh, data uh, into public cloud, uh, encrypting, uh, and I don't know, maybe the law will be uh, less, uh, less compliant with this, uh, with this request. But uh, uh, we are trying to uh, demonstrate that once it will be possible to put data Right now, we don't have uh, privacy and um, personal data on this use case. It's just uh, uh, the, these data are still on premise. We cannot put them into public cloud, but uh, we did uh, the exercise to enable our business to go if we decide if one day the regulatory will be different. But uh, we that, did, uh, and now there's the GDPR, right? So things are going, the general data regulation policy, I mean. No, no, it's, but it's a great question because uh, it's our CIO that is always saying that uh, on-prem infrastructure is always more expensive than off-prem, uh, but it's not always like this. In this case, no. Hi. Hi. Uh, how long did it take for you guys to finish the migration uh, to the new infrastructure? Uh, it was more complex to build the infrastructure than migrating because... Uh, uh, 
everything was different to be, um, from uh, what uh, my colleagues are used to. So it was more difficult to put uh, the machines in the data center, connect them via BGP, uh, discuss with the TLC department that everything was really fine, uh, with the security department that asked us, uh, can we put uh, like a thousand firewalls between servers and switches and racks and agents. so on. Agents, they wanted the agents. But uh, at the end, uh, we, st we had previously a Docker data center uh, uh, installation on virtual machines. And then we moved uh, basically the, the application to the, to the other infrastructure. But it was more complex to build from the ground up uh, the data center for containers. OK. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, yeah? uh, one question, maybe two. Uh, first of all, uh, I appreciate this, uh, this uh, presentation. It's really inspired me. And I've got a few questions about the um, images you uh, produce. Uh, I assume you have some uh, security guidelines for uh, all the operating systems like Linux or Windows. And uh, do you apply any hardening uh, or any very secure um, settings of operating system into the base image of Windows and Linuxes, or you use the straight uh, images uh, from the public registry uh, of your base images for operating systems? There are quite different levels of things that we do. Um, first, we don't use the public images, at least we don't use them directly. There are a few images, uh, I mean, when you have just to start something and you want to try, we probably use them, uh, we just pull, but uh, proxied version in our registry, not from the internet, because that thing is not connected to the internet, right? And for the mm, security enforcement policy and things like that, there's a pipeline in the continuous integration that pass through a few steps all the produced images and unpacks them and looks in them and things like that. And uh, from the from other security perspectives like um, run times and uh, looking at the images, what the goes in the clusters, there's the notary which is built in the Docker data center. There's the image trust uh, registry, so uh, the two framework and this like that. So it's almost secure. Um, yeah, by the way, there are a lot of things that the security department does by not saying at all, but. <laughs> We don't really know. So do you have any security officers involved in all the projects that they told you this is okay, this is uh, not? I mean, uh, yes, if you don't know that they are involved, they are probably involved later. No, no, you need to involve uh, the security department uh, when you are studying containers. It's yeah. the first thing, even before the business case. So basically, you need to, to sit down at the table with the security guys, explain them uh, what, uh, add, what features you are adding to the operating system you are uh, currently using and it's certified by them. So this is my advice for you, personal advice. For, for example, if the... Otherwise it will be a huge pain to, to put into production the, the, the data center Anything. and then explain to the security guys why you did it. <laughs> for example, if we did not the encrypted networking, we couldn't do this thing. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question about uh, some different licensing, licensing models which come from the vendor, yeah? because, uh, well, still a lot of vendors are not fully prepared to move to the containerized version and try to count the number of cores and uh, such kind of stuff. Do you have an issue with that? Or, you all, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that all your software is independent from such kind of different vendor providers. Yeah. No, we, we are discussing, well, we have uh, the vendors uh, inside our company. We meet them uh, really often. And then uh, when we studied uh, the Docker Data Center implementation, we also checked the license models of each, uh, of each uh, provider. Yeah, but I'm asking about, you know, this legacy part, like, I don't know, JBoss exactly, or Red Hat, mm -hmm. so you, that we, you can virtualize, but only on the open shift, or you yeah. still count the, the... That's why it was partially supported, because uh, you need to stick to the... To we hadn't found a solution to that, basically. To the JBoss team. Ah, okay, yeah. It's it, was, it was just an example, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to sort out if you are supported uh, on the stack that you want to use. Thank you. <laughs> All right, anyway, thanks, everybody. Thank you both. It was a great presentation.
Um, thanks Thank everybody you. for joining us. If you're going to be in here, or actually any track, the next track starts in 15 minutes. But I really appreciate it. Have a big, uh, big round of applause for these guys.